investigator for emancipatory future studies in the Anthropocene. Big mouthful. Um, so this is the platform, the public platform of this project, and um, we've hosted various international and national uh, thinkers and practitioners that are grappling with the issue of, um, well, climate change meeting the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is a big idea. Uh, it's an idea used by geologists, and it's now officially deemed a new epoch in geological history uh, and time. Uh, and this largely has got to do with, if you like, our impact as a species on the conditions of life on planet Earth. Uh, and it's a category that marks our geological time, climate time, and, uh, and, and historical time. Um, for the past few days, we've had the privilege of learning from and thinking with Kohei Saito uh, from Japan. Kohei is an associate professor of political economy at Osaka uh, City University in Japan. He's the author of the award-winning Karl Marx's Eco-Socialism, Capital, Nature, and an Unfinished Critique of Political Economy, and the co-editor of well, MEGA, which is a project that really began in the 20s to put together everything that Marx and Engels has written. Kohei has done part-breaking work. Uh, he's, he's schooled and uh, linguistically capable of speaking fluent German and French, and he did his PhD in Germany and studied German and he read Hegel and Marx in German. And so he, he, he studied what is really new material, um, particularly Marx's uh, scientific notebooks, and unearthed a whole different understanding of how Marx grapples with ecology in his thought. Now, this was very much after Capital was published. So Kohei has really, if you like, uh, illuminated a whole new angle, a whole new perspective of understanding Marx's approach uh, to ecological relations. But tonight, he's going to bring it all together um, in a public lecture titled Marx and the Idea of Eco-Socialism in the Anthropocene. Thank you to all of you for coming. Over to you. Thank you, Bish, for introducing me. I'm very pleased to be here and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion because this is kind of a new topic for me. Like, you know, last one year or so I've been working on this new project, updating uh, what I have been doing in the contemporary context, in the there are a lot of debates on uh, eco-socialism as well as more eco-modernist vision of the future society, and I'm trying to intervene into these debates uh, with my analysis of uh, Marx's notebooks as well as his manuscripts for capital. So I try to sort of build up on my previous work which deals with Marx's notebooks and try to expand it more to update it, update Marx's argument into the contemporary context. So let's see how it works for me. But I'm trying to present the general debates recently going on in Marxism that is very actual and I try to show the importance and uh, further discussions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the situation is that in the last century and in the last 20 years, in the 21st century, what we are witnessing is on the one hand increasing like massive productivity, right? And then the problem is that while, of course, we are getting a lot of merits from this increase of productivity, uh, precisely this rapid and enormous development of productive forces are also causing the significant deepening of the ecological crisis there in the form of the climate breakdown, desertification, soil erosion, and disruption of nitrogen cycle, and mass extinction of species and so on. So what we are witnessing is that, you know, in, 
in 1990, Francis Fukuyama basically declared after the collapse of Soviet Union that basically the liberal capitalism is the final stage of human history. So this is the end of history that he described. And what actually happened, however, in the last 30 years is that this domination of neoliberal capitalism all over the world created a totally unexpected form of end of history, which is the end of history of human civilization because of this ecological crisis on a global scale. So this is a problem that Fukuyama didn't expect this. You know, we are witnessing a really hard situation currently. And some geologists try to describe this situation by using new terminology, or a new concept, which is Anthropocene. And this is basically a new geological epoch in which the humans have become a major geological force. So if you look at the surface of the Earth, the, you know, the newest layer of geological surface on the Earth is covered actually by the traces of human activities. Yeah. Agriculture, streets, buildings, dam, and the atmosphere is full of carbon dioxide being produced, and also if you look at the ocean, it's full of plastics. Right? So, so everything in the surface is covered by what we have produced. So this is an age of humans, the Anthropocene. <coughs> And this seems to realize, on the one hand, exactly what Bill McMahon in 1989 described as end of nature. So there is no more end nature as such, right? You don't look anything. Flowers, trees, you know. Everything is actually already modified by humans, like somehow. Right? So basically, what we are witnessing is the disappearance of nature as such. But this didn't realize, unfortunately, the modern dream of realizing human domination over nature. So there was a modern project is like, you know, alien force of nature must be subjected to human control, and that's the basic way of realizing human freedom. So that's why we developed the technologies and the sciences, so forth and so forth. But what happened is that, in the end, we are witnessing this increasing inability to control nature. We are actually experiencing unfreedom, alienation, suffering in the form of the typhoon damage, severe drought, and in the future it's going to be coming with the sea level rise. And these are things that humans cannot control. So what happened is that we thought that the end of nature was there, but now in the 21st century in the Anthropocene, what we are witnessing is the return of nature. There's a new nature that we cannot control. So, I think one of the most clear example is the climate breakdown. Yeah. We, we used to go to global warming, the sound is nice. You know, even for some people, like people in Swiss or Russia, think that, oh, global warming is kind of nice, but it's not. So we have to now say climate breakdown or climate crisis. It's not just like warming up. And, yeah, yeah, and the problem is that the scientist says that the increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius is already quite dangerous. But still, to maintain the current form of civilization, that's like the maximum increase in temperature. But to do realize this, in, or to contain the temperature increase by 2100 within 1.5 degrees Celsius, it requires the 50% cut of CO2 emission by 2030, so in 10 years or so. And we have to realize a zero net emission by 2050. So this requires a really a significant change of our way of life and our way of producing things and consuming things. If we don't anything, if we continue to uh, emit the same amount of CO2 at the current level, it is said that the temperature rise by 2100 will be something like 4.8 degrees Celsius. But because of the, some feedback mechanism, it can be higher. So that's going to be catastrophic. It's going to be the end of history. 
So in this situation, you know, even global elites and capitalists thought that it's kind of dangerous, and they tried to come up with some countermeasure. And one example is the Paris Agreement, right? That was an important achievement, I'd say, but still it's very insufficient because even the promises of Paris Agreement are satisfied. Thus, it is said that it's going to be like around 1.5 services will be achieved or like reached by around 2040. And then by 2100, it's going to be around 3 degrees Celsius increase. So that's not solving this issue at all. The climate breakdown will occur. This is why in Europe, especially, the younger generations are standing up and asking for a more rapid change for the wage change, the Friday for Future, and Extinction Rebellion, and asking for a rapid change in terms of economic and social system. But uh, what we are witnessing in EU politics, basically the government's inability to respond to the, this call from the younger generation. So what we are witnessing is basically that politicians are not capable of thinking beyond their own next election. They cannot think about 40, 50 years ahead. This is why the current system has been wasting our precious time to do something against climate crisis. They have been only occupied about maintaining their power, their wealth, and so they are very much afraid of changing things. <coughs> Since the existing system cannot offer a solution to the climate crisis, then the solution must come from outside. So this is also the opportunity for the left to you know, go beyond this pessimism in the last 30 years and really engage in this debate for coming up with another type of future. The post-capitalist imagination must come from radical left. And one example that I'm advocating here is eco-socialism. And of course, you know, eco-socialism is about socialism. So I would say that Marxism is very important. But some people actually think, uh -huh, this is it? Uh -huh. Because Marxism doesn't really seem promising, actually to, actually to many people. Because his view is very naive, many people think. You know? It's about increasing productivity and dominating nature. Like for example, in the Communist Manifesto, he said, the bourgeoisie during its rule of scarce and 100 years has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. Subjection of nature's forces to man, machinery, application of chemistry to industry and agriculture, steam navigation, railways, electric telegraph, clearing whole continents for cultivation, <coughs> canalization of rivers, whole populations conjured out of the ground. So this is like, you know, he's anticipating the answer of Muslim, I could say, but he's very much celebrating this as a creating the conditions for the future society. So this kind of Marxism is uh, very productivist and not very promising to think of as a way of thinking uh, ecological crisis. However, this is what we usually learn in class. I'm not sure about the undergraduate class in South Africa, but you know, in Japan or in America, this is what, <coughs> what you students usually learn. And the vision of historical materialism understood as the contradiction of the relations of production and the productive forces in capitalism, there's always increasing productivity under capitalism because of market com competition. But that also creates the increasing number of the proletariat. No one day this will be explored as the proletarian revolution creating social society. But as I said, this vision is very deterministic and also productivist and totally incompatible with environmental thought. However, not everyone thinks it's this way. Huh? Because in recent years, what we are witnessing is that passionate defense of Prometheanism among the left. The people like Ray Graciel basically said, no, the left must defend this modernist idea of progress, human emancipation, and this rejecting of any limits, including natural limits. 
And this type of idea has high affinity with what we call eco-modernism. The eco-modernism is basically an idea that the Anthropocene is already, you know, at the age in which the everything is modified by humans, no nature. So what we have to do is basically not giving up the further intervention. On the contrary, we have to intervene more for the sake of survival of humanity. So this is the you know, tied to the art concept of stewardship of the arts and then Bruno Latour, a very famous French sociologist, said, love your monsters. So it's not about giving up the technology that we invented. It's about inventing it would be irresponsible to give up those technologies, he said. It is necessary to use these technologies, love these technologies, and control the entire art system for the sake of survival of humanity. So which includes technologies like nuclear power plants and geoengineering. But these technologies are actually quite dangerous. I come from Japan, and what happened in Fukushima is disastrous. But the people from eco-modernism say, no, but we cannot give up these technologies because we are witnessing the very serious ecological crisis. The only way to save humans is further intervention in using these new technologies. And some Marxists accept this idea, and they argue for this Promethean Marxism. And they, they basically criticize the social movements like degrowth movements, and the, you know, produce locally, consume locally, these local, small-scale social movements cannot solve the global ecological crisis. I mean, it makes sense, but at the same time, then they argue for accelerating the technological development under capitalism. They fully endorse the, what's going on under capitalism, because these technologies can be maximally accelerated, so it's full automation, it, to the point where they blow capitalism sky high. And what will come is fully automated luxury communism. <laughs> Produce many things. But it's, 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 these people are serious. Like, people like Aaron Bastani, he just published a book called Fully Automated Luxury Communism. Basically, the abundance is automation destroys the system of value. But everything becomes free and we can consume a lot and there's no more market. But at the same time there's a danger of eco-fascism because these technologies are quite dangerous. Right? The nuclear power plants and geoengineering and we can, can we really simply say that we can use these technology for future society? Because actually they talk about ecological crisis but there's no ecological or environmental ethics here. Right? They simply say this <laughs> crisis must be tackled by technology <coughs> that capitalism invented. So there is no eco ecology actually. So in this sense, I understand that many people, even if they are sympathetic to Marxism, criticize Marx for just a Promethean thinker. People like Nancy Fraser says, you know, Marx thought fails to reckon systematically with gender, ecology, political power, and structural principle and axis of inequality in capitalist society, let alone as stakes and premises of social struggle. So basically Fraser is saying that you know Marx was only concerned with class struggle, but he missed ecology. And Sven Eric Liedemann he also published a very thick biography of Marx, where he says Marx cannot be considered as an ecologically conscious person in the modern sense, because Marx believed that he can somehow dominate nature. So it's a very dominant view, even today, that there is no ecology in Marx. So Marx is not useful to think about ecological crisis in the Anthropocene. However, Actually, some people, these people missing under the current of Marxism uh, because they are attempt after the collapse of Soviet Union to come up with a non-Promethean Marx. Right? Marx against Prometheanism, the eco-modernism. And I think that this kind of interpretation of Marx can present 
the idea of eco-socialist post-capitalism. And they argue that ecological crisis is the manifestation of the contradiction of the capitalist society. And that's why in order to overcome this contradiction, the new society, socialism, must be sustainable and somehow realize the coexistence and co-development of its nature. And this view is actually quite dominant, I would say. I mean, not dominant, but it's becoming more and more important. And people like Nancy, no, not Nancy, for example, Naomi Klein, she's not a Marxist, but she endorses also the idea of eco-socialism as an alternative to neoliberal capitalism. She says, for example, let's acknowledge this fact that the Soviet Union and the Venezuela, there's a real theory existing socialism, are unecological, while also pointing out that countries with strong democratic socialist tradition like Denmark, Sweden, Uruguay, have some of the most visionary environmental policies in the world. From this, we can conclude that socialism isn't necessarily ecological, like Russia and Venezuela, but that the new form of democratic eco-socialism here, she uses this term, with the humility to learn from indigenous teachings about duties to future generations, and the interconnection of all of life appears to be the humanity's best shot at the collective survival. So she now endorses this idea of eco-socialism, but at the same time she's criticized because she talks about indigenous teachings, important, etc., criticized from eco-modernists that she's romantic, and she's advocating for degrowth and that green austerity, etc. But actually she is also you know, supporting Green New Deal. She is very passionate about this idea of Green New Deal. And she wrote this manifesto called the Leap Manifesto. Basically she is advocating you know, kind of investment in construction of green energy power plants, and construction of free public transportation, energy efficient public houses, and so on. But also she emphasizes the importance of democratic participation in the management of these resources and the basic infrastructures. And she also says that we need to shift from the high carbon capitalist industries to low carbon industry based on care, such as education, hospital, journalism, etc. And she sums up this as a Green New Deal, as a path to make social. So, I mean, I don't have an answer yet. Maybe we can discuss this later in the discussion time. But, you know, how should we evaluate this kind of Green New Deal? Should, we, should the left reject this, or should we actually support what Klein is saying? Not quite sure. Yet. But in any case, this is one example, and uh, even people like Klein is influenced by the left-wing discourse of eco-socialism, and the underlying is a revival of Marxian ecology after the year 2000. And the one attempt is a second contradiction of capitalism. James O'Connor said in one journal, you know, this is a new type of contradiction in capitalism. Because on the one hand, increasing productivity is happening, but that also undermines the material and natural condition of production. So what happens is underproduction of nature. So nature gets exhausted, and the nature can no longer provide what capital needs. So the price of raw materials go up, and then that will impact upon the rate of profit, the rate of profit goes down. So that would stagnate the economy and destabilizes the system, maybe revolution. And this idea is recently very popular because Jason Moore in his Capitalism in the Web of Life basically employed this kind of theory by his concept of the end of cheap nature and, you know, audience for this now we are witnessing the difficult crisis because of the end of cheap nature. So in any case, the other approach is, as you might know, this one is more famous, uh, one by John Bellamy Foster and Paul Bucket that the concept of metabolic lift. So Marx defines labor as a mediation of metabolism, which 
in a human nature. So this is trans-historical condition. As long as humans try to live on this planet, we have to labor, to work up on nature, and then consume, produce, and this process is described as metabolism. And the metabolism is, however, very different in each society, because the labor, how labor is organized socially, is very different in each society. Now what is characteristic to the capitalist way of organizing so social labor is that it is basically organized for the sake of maximizing profit. Because now labor becomes the source of value, right? the labor theory of value. And then, so this means that capital treats basically uses nature and labor only as a means to gain profit. So, the labor process in which humans and nature conduct this metabolic interaction is subordinated to the logical capital. And what happens is that, according to Foster and Bucket, I mean, this is what also Marx himself says, there's got to be a disruption or a rift in the metabolism between humans and nature. Because capital doesn't care about sustainability. They only, capital only cares about profit maximization, so in the end, there's a logic of capital, the logic of nature, then they just diverge so much that they then environmental crisis. This is what Marx says, capitalism produces conditions that provoke an irreparable rift, so this is the concept of metabolic rift, comes from, in the interdependent process between social metabolism and natural metabolism. So lift is a manifestation of ecological crisis. He also says in volume one of Capital, this passage I quoted many times uh, yesterday and day before yesterday, capitalist mode of production collects the population together in great centers and causes our population to achieve an ever-growing preponderance. It disturbs the public interaction between man and the earth, i.e. it prevents the return to the soil of its constituent elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing. Hence, it hinders the operation of eternal natural condition for the lasting fertility of the soil. And he talks about soil, but we can expand this to other issues as well, as we will see. So the problem is that basically, there are two kinds of time, capital's time, and nature's time, and the capital try to shorten this time, right? so that they can make more profit. But nature's time cannot be so easily modified. Tree grows in 30 years, it cannot grow in one week, or a cow cannot grow in one week. It's the same thing, but the nature has its own time. But capital tries to shorten this as much as possible. Because of these two times get so diverse, which creates the lift. The one example is deforestation, but it can happen in terms of oil, rare metals, and anything. And Marx says that this type of increase of productivity is not sustainable. So if it's not sustainable, even if the increase happens in terms of productivity, this is only a temporal one, right? So this is not a real increase, it's only a robbery. That's a, Marx cites this as a robbery, so we have to distinguish between robbery and the real development of productive forces, which is sustainable. So the concept of sustainability for Marx is quite central in terms of development of productive forces. And Marx continued to do this, expand this. I just quoted one passage on agriculture and the other one on forest, like forestation, deforestation. But he also tried to expand this by very much intensively studying geology, mineralogy, and biology, and even botanics, and etc. And he tried to expand this to the problem of the rift, not only to soil exhaustion, but also to excessive deforestation, premature slaughter of animals, and extinction of species. And these are things that Marx was already interested in in 19th century. This is surprising. And these texts become so inspiration for the current application of ecological Marxism. They develop 
this concept of metabolic lift in different fields. Stefano Longo deals with the aqua ecology, like the fishery and so on. And Ryan Guntaman deals with livestock agribusiness in the American the contemporary society. And Philip Manx also discusses the issue of nitrogen fertilizer. So this concept turns out quite productive uh, to analyze the current uh, ecological crisis. And going back to Marx, it's interesting to see that he also quite explicitly said that sustainability must be realized in socialism. He read a book called Klima und Pflanzenwelt, Die Geschichte Weide, Climate and Plant World, and in this book, Frass warns against excessive deforestation because it would ultimately change the local climate and that would make the agriculture very difficult and that would ultimately undermine the civilization. So, reading this book, Marx said, oh, he has unconscious social tendencies. It's unconscious because Flas was very pessimistic and he thought that you know we cannot solve this problem. The Europe might one day just collapse because of the excessive deforestation. But Marx says in this remark we have the recognition that capitalism is not sustainable. That's why this is a huge problem. Right? That's why Flas was writing this book. And so in this remark we can actually see that Marx was saying Marx was thinking socialism as a response to the unsustainable or like destructive uh, production which really brings about huge alienation from nature. And that's why Marx says we need to establish a conscious, sustainable metabolic interaction between humans and nature in socialism. He says the task is basically the associated producers govern their metabolic interaction with nature rationally. Like rationally means, you know, sustainable, it's the same thing. So this is what he said in Capital Volume 3. And from this perspective, coming back to the two types of crisis that the James O'Connor said, and I'm trying to criticize him here because there are two approaches, yeah? second contradiction of capitalism and the metabolic lift approach, but the metabolic lift cannot be equivalent to the economic crisis. O'Connor thinks that one day nature gets exhausted and that would create economic crisis and that will delegitimize capitalism and the socialism will come. But what happened, what we are witnessing today is that Capitalism is so elastic. This concept of elasticity is also very important in Marx's text. He emphasizes this concept many times. Capital doesn't just break down. It's so elastic that they always find new ways to deal with this crisis, either ecological or either economical. For example, in ecological crisis, they always find new ways, new GMOs, new pesticides, new fertilizer, and they actually profit from ecological crisis, right? So they find a new way, new business chance. So the problem is, ecological crisis does not lead to economic crisis, but the ecological crisis surely leads to the crisis of free, sustainable human development. It undermines the conditions for us or for our sustainable development. Because capital always try to shift the problem to somewhere else. You know, that's another example. So the lift is basically always shifted to somewhere else. Shifted to the periphery of capital so that people in the global north don't have to see. This is the basic concept that the post and Clark suggest at the environmental interview. In Marx's time, the Guano, I talked about this two days ago, so I'm not going into this, but maybe we can discuss this today as one example. So the problem is that the exploitation of natural resources and rare metals and or plastic recycles 
they are marginalized in the global south so that these resources are going to global north but the contradiction, like the pollution and you know, exhaustion of nature and stuff, deforestation these are actually shifted to the contradiction of the periphery in capitalism one example is agrofuel you know, some people celebrate agrofuel as a clean energy and, but the, what's happening in Brazil, for example, is that for the sake of producing agrofuel consumed in America there's going to be monoculture in Brazil that pushes back farmers, local farmers, back to you know, forests and they are forced to cut jungles so that in the end rather increases the total emission of CO2 and what's more, destroy the local environment and the local farming it's a local non-capitalist way of sustainable agriculture is destroyed and they are pushed forward to cut down the jungle so only this way capitalism can deal with this crisis and by deepening economic and ecological contradiction so what's important here is another concept that I want to emphasize today in Marx eh? is the productive forces of capital capitalism of course develops technology and science it's of course useful in many ways but he, Marx did not simply praise that any technology is good because he knew, he was clearly conscious that capitalism develops technologies and productive forces only in order to enforce capitalist domination over workers right? instead of liberating workers from work so it is also the same thing in terms of nature it also creates greater rupture in metabolism <coughs> and always try to shift this metabolic lift to somewhere else the example is again geoengineering this geoengineering is a technology that impacts the entire earth system but this will be introduced by the addition of the few in the north, global north but the impact will be marginal negative consequences that scientists want about geoengineering will be marginalized to somewhere else that the rich people will have to really experience so I mean I can come up with another example, climate example, etc but we can go to another example so the problem is I think by this concept of productive forces of capital so basically capital develops productive forces for its own not for future society that's what, what Marx was saying the problem with non-eco-modernist Marxism is that they basically endorse these productive forces as somehow emancipatory but it's not according to Marx because the capitalist innovation does not lead to the solution as seen in the example of geoengineering the technology is not a solution and what's dangerous about eco-modernist Marxism is that they basically fall into the fetish of capitalist technology as I said, innovation under capitalism only leads to the outsourcing or shifting of the contradiction to the periphery and this is also the new concept suggested by Ulrich Brandt in Germany by Kachi actually in the imperial living spice, the imperial mode of living because the people in global north don't have to see the contradiction because they can always outsource the negative consequences to someone else so do we give up all kind of technology? no, right? because otherwise we give up the idea of progress and development and that's not Marxism I would say just we need to distinguish technologies, kinds of technologies and the kind of development one way is about distinguishing globally the true development of productive forces the other way is distinguishing open technology and locking technology this is according to Andrew Forbes the open technologies are one that promotes communication, cooperation and interaction with other people on a larger scale democratic management of things, that's an open technology but the locking technologies are the one that enslave the <coughs> user and monopolize the supply of the product or service think about the nuclear power plant that's open technology or locking technology it's locking technology 
And by nature, it's blocking the technology. It's impossible to democratically control nuclear power plants because then there will be the issue of security, right? The dangerous, dangerous technology must be kept in secret. So we can distinguish certain technologies are by nature way of monopolizing resources and a way of monopolizing and uh, isolating people from connecting each other. So what we need is developing the open technology instead of blocking technology. But the eco modernists don't distinguish these kind of technologies. So they even end those blocking technologies that somehow emancipate. As I said, technology is not solution. So what we need is to challenge the fundamental social relations. And in that sense, I, this is, you know, green capitalism is not enough. Because green capitalism is only happening very late. So it's not fast enough. As I said in the beginning, we need a radical reduction in the carbon dioxide emission. But green capitalism only functions very, very slowly. So maybe one day it's possible, theoretically, but it's going to be probably too late. But that doesn't lead to the massive state intervention from above. That's going to be dangerous. That's going to be eco-fascism. So we need to develop a more democratic technology, open technologies for <coughs> democratically managing the metabolic interaction with nature. So that's the basic idea of association in Marx. And the other problem is that Green New Deal associated with this green capitalism may simply strengthen the environmental imperialism in the territory. So in America, people may live in green energy, but that's based on the exploitation of the workers in Chile and China, and the, you know, the mines are massively exploit, exploited, and the forests are cut down, etc. That's not the way we envision eco-socialism. Right? But the Green New Deal, by nature, can be very productivist and very dangerous. But maybe some people might defend Green New Deal. And I'm also ambitious ambivalent about this, so we can have discussion. So the conclusion is that, in any case, the socialism is not about domination of nature. I think, I hope, I made it clear. It's about conscious and democratic control of metabolic interaction between humans and nature. This is the basic insight of eco-socialism. And this is what development productivity or productive forces, in Marx's sense, should realize, and not globally. <coughs> and it is, for this sake, it is necessary to abandon the productivist understanding of Marxism and abandon the class-centered understanding of history. So we need to connect the problem of class to other issues such as ecology, as I said, but the environmental imperialism also requires the, including the dimensions of race and gender, etc. So we need a more encompassing vision of socialism. We need to update it radically because the idea of socialism associated with traditional Marxism in the USSR is very productivist and cross-centered. What we need today is really updating Marxism again. And actually, interesting. This is what Marx was also doing in his late years. And then these are published in the ethnological notebooks in English as well. So if you read this, like Marx intensively studied non-capitalist, pre-capitalist, non-Western societies to find out ways of more equal and sustainable societies. So we can also learn still a lot from Marx in the 20th century. Thank you so much.